Lord. Yeah, I just hit the record button, man, because um, we're starting yeah. in a couple of minutes. But that topic right there, I swear, me and my wife was just talking about that probably a couple months ago before we moved here to Missouri. Um, you know how these guys are, are on the corner selling dope or whatever to, to make some money. Yeah. So, whereas all that, these huge fields, you know, are just sitting right yeah. next to the housing projects. And I'm just wondering if it would be like it was in Colorado. Because what I experienced in Colorado, I saw uh, the, the local government coming down on uh, people for doing things like um, putting barrels outside and saving snow and melting it so they didn't have to pay a high water bill yeah. to water their yeah. crops. You know, so they were can't coming down on them and saying, you can't do that. And I wonder if they would come down on people who living in the projects and tell them they're not supposed to garden. You know, that sort of deal. So that's definitely something that, that should be done. They'll put some money in their pocket for sure and some food on the table. I mean, you're right on it, Gus. Uh, I think uh, pound for pound, um, the amount of produce you can sell versus uh, the amount of, like, dope um, – um, that you can sell, you can turn a higher profit. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's just from a, from a business uh, business aspect right there, and especially um, and then doing like community profit. So one, you're turning a profit by selling the produce, and then uh, you're saving money by actually having uh, produce available to yourself. Um, yeah. And, I mean, it's it, it's transforming, and so you don't have to like depend on. Um, it's just like a, a place like in Savannah where we have food deserts. Uh, all yeah. over the place, you know, our, our nearest grocery store sometimes from us is like, uh, you know, 15, 20 miles. And so we, all we had is those, uh, those small corner stores to, to go get uh, food from or, or right on MLK when we got the fast food runs. Um, that stuff is like in the reach of us, and but we couldn't get to a, a grocery store, man. Yeah. Um, that easily. You know, you have to catch two buses uh, in a transfer to go pick up some groceries. Uh, that are um, somewhat healthy, and we had all that uh, unused land that was sitting around us, um, yep. right there in Cape Hole, and right there, you know, over there in West Savannah. I mean, we had these huge plots of lands that we uh, that we didn't use, utilize yeah. our advantage. Yeah, that would that would have done so much dividends as far as uh, putting food on the table, like you said, and also putting some money in some of these kids' pockets, and furthermore, teaching them a skill that they could take up mm-hmm. to a broader level if they wanted to take it somewhere else afterwards um, you know, when it comes to agriculture. And it, it, count, it compounds, you know, in so many ways because not only are you, like you said, saving money because you're not buying certain produce, but you're also eating more healthy. You're also able to focus on things other than eating, like education, because that's taken care of, you know. And then, like you said, you know, you make some money by, by selling it. That's just something that um, I, I really think we should take a look at. Um, and one, one of my partners, um, uh, we went to Iraq together to, um, in 2010, the guy named Rich High. Uh, he's at W4. His son is 22 years old, and he's running for mayor right now. Um, this guy by the name of Braylon High. Look him up. 22 yeah. years old, just graduated from LSU with a, a degree in um, political science. And this guy's trying to make these kind of changes. And... Um, in, in these communities, man. And he's young, and keep an eye out for that kid. Um, I'm going to make sure I put a, a link, if I haven't already, on the mentors page. But that young kid is making moves. And I think, you know, leadership is a hard thing when it, when, when it comes to the black community because a lot of us want to, you know, we want to do our work and we want to shy back a little bit and sort of relax. But I think more of us should take, uh, you know, a cue from that young man. And, man, if you're not running for, like, governor or something like that, you know, alderman or city council or even mayor um, will be a great fit for these kinds of ideas. People who came up, like you and I came up, and are able to uh, bring these kind of innovative thought processes to our community. What's going on, Martise? Yeah, yeah, you definitely What's up, man? Yep. And I, th- I think I see four people here, and somebody else texted me. Uh, Denise, is, you, you there, Denise? Yeah, she's here. We're here. Okay. All right. You guys are uh, um, doing good, everybody? It's just George? Yeah, that's me. Denise here, too. What's going on, bro? <laughs> hey, it's, it's How you guys time. doing? Oh, I'm man, we're doing good. Yeah, we're doing real good. Yep. Okay. 
Man, it's good to see everybody back. Well, welcome back, Martis. How, how was Korea? Uh, it, was, it was indeed, it was intriguing. It was something new, put it like that. <laughs> Different experience. You ain't getting no food poison, did you? <laughs> no, no, no. I ain't eat too much of it. I ain't touch too much of it. <laughs> hey, hey now, how, how, the, how the baby doing? You know, crying right now. Oh, man, ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm going to deal with that tomorrow. My boy, he's getting his tonsils out. Oh, man. Yep. Yeah, but I'm I'm not gonna prolong this thing. Um, it's it's open discussion, so um, I'm gonna mute everybody for the purpose of uh, making sure that uh, the initial thoughts come out clear, and then um, feel free to just chime in, um, unmute yourself if you got something to say, and then mute back so we save uh, you know, on any of that ambient noise that's out there in the background. And I think a few more people said that they're gonna um, log in as well, so I'm just gonna go ahead and mute all, and if if by any chance something goes wrong with the slides or anything, um, just let me know. Um, but it's not that many slides, maybe about four slides all together. And we're just going to talk about scope of influence. Okay. By now you guys already know uh, myself and Amir um, and how we typically format these things. In the last session, we had talked about uh, the reason for the excuse, and um, that was a pretty good session. Uh, it wasn't really high attendance, but as always, they're um, archived and saved on the website, so you can go there and check those out. And guest speakers today will be myself, and there's also Amir. He's going to talk about uh, some thoughts that he had uh, for a newsletter for improving the community in several ways. And also, um, I hope he shares some of his experience because he just did a really long stint. He'll tell you exactly how long living in Africa, and I think it's just really, really, really insightful and intriguing, um, the experiences that he had over there. So I hope a lot of that comes out during the session. Okay, basically we're going to talk about scope of influence. And um, the reason I wanted to talk about scope of influence because uh, about a month ago I came across um, a video on social media, which I'm going to share here in a minute, and it's talking about the tragic death of a young man by the name of Trevon Johnson. He's a college student, um, and, uh, you know, apparently he was trying to get some extra money, and he was doing it through, you know, nefarious activity, breaking into somebody's house. And, um, okay, that's that. You know, that sort of thing happens in, in our communities. Um, but the thing that struck me and wanted me to talk about scope of influence um, was the fact that uh, – one of uh, the people in his life said something that was very intriguing. So, uh, well, before we go too far, I'm just going to play what she said. Just hang on a second. Okay. Hello, everyone. Relatives of 17-year-old Trayvon Johnson are angry. The teenager was shot and killed last night by a homeowner who police say was protecting her property. He was not supposed to die like this. He had a future ahead of him. Trayvon had goals. He was a very funny guy. He was very big on education. He loved going to school. He loved learning. It. Last night, Miami-Dade police say the D.A. Dorsey Technical College student burglarized a home south of 79th Street near I-95, just blocks away from where he lives. Detectives say the 54-year-old homeowner was started of the break-in by her security system. With officers already on their way, she rushed home to check things out, and police say she was armed. She observed the suspect exiting the home from the rear. According to detectives, there was a confrontation, and one shot was fired. Johnson was pronounced dead at the hospital. What's wrong with her? She did not have to shoot him. It's no reason that she should wait until after he walked out of the yard. She was like, already, man. Why would she shoot him? Relatives say they don't believe Johnson stole anything from the home, but the detectives would not confirm that. You have to understand, you have to say from every um, child's point of view that was raised in the hood, how he going to get his money to have clothes and go to school. Okay, I'm going to stop it right there. Um, I'm going to stop it right there um, because I think that's a, the thought that keys in on the thought that um, really resonates here um, in terms of scope of influence. Okay, this young man was caught burglarizing somebody's house and here his loved ones are talking to the news media saying that, um, you know, we have to look at things from every point of view. 
And how is he supposed to get his money for school clothes to go to school? And um, that in itself tells me that, okay, the, the kid's in school, so obviously he has um, some good influences, but he thinks that he needs um, certain clothes to go to school, and he also thinks that it's okay to steal from other people to get those clothes. Um, and that tells me that there's also some bad influences in this young man's life. So that brings us to the question, what is scope of influence? And uh, also, um, where should we place our energy on the things that concern us, on the things that we directly control? Okay, so before we go, um, you know, I'm, I want to unmute uh, everyone and see if there's any thoughts about uh, what was just said. Then I am. Any thoughts on that video? Or is anybody seeing this thing differently than I am? Okay, I'll go ahead and press forward then. Okay, basically what I'm going to talk about now is um, the scope of influence, okay? And this, this Venn diagram that I'm going to talk about now basically comes from, uh, hang on a second, I got a, got a phone call coming in. Let me take this call real quick. Hey, what's going on, Johnny? Yes, yeah, already started. Uh, you got the login information. Okay. Okay. Uh, you remember how we did it when we did that Python uh, class yeah. last week? Same way. Just log into the same place. Same place. Yep. Exact same place. If that's in your email. And it's uh, mmm. Yep. mmmdb01 is the uh, online meeting ID. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm going to be up there for a little bit because I'm in contact. I'm in Mississippi. Uh, the business of my wife, people, and they got a uh, pastor's uh, anniversary of the All right, brother. I'll see you there. All right. All right. Okay, sorry about that. Basically, this comes from um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and we're talking about here universe of concern. And the universe of concern is pretty much life. You know, all the things that happen all around us that we should be concerned about, lots of us are concerned about, and um, we can't necessarily do anything immediately about them in our current state. You know, and within the universe of concern, you can sort of section off the scope of influence. And scope of influence is, is, is more closely compacted into the realm of what we can uh, actually affect and without trying trying, we do have a direct effect on those factors in life that we have an influence on. And within that sphere is the sphere of concern. And this is more uh, involved with us, ourselves, the things that we, that we absolutely control. Okay? So I'm just going to press forward a little bit and draw some more detail into this universal concern. That will be things like racism, economy, people in general, bad people. Uh, the past, whether or not you had a bad childhood or something like that, or the laws, or the weather. I mean, you definitely can't control the weather, although you can do things according to some scientists to affect the weather. And the laws, if you were to educate yourself, you might be able to impact the laws and, and you know, have some involvement in that. The past, you definitely can't change the past. People, you can't control people. You can influence people. And then there's the economy, you know. I put dashed lines here because, you know, you could bleed over into these things and, and have a positive impact on, on the economy and things like racism, but you'll never be able to completely control them. So let's talk about the things we can't control. Uh, when, when talking about that sphere of control, that's the man in the mirror, so to speak. That we're talking about our character here and our thoughts, you know, which contribute to our character, our speech, the way we talk, our actions and our habits, and all of these things are directly within each of our personal sphere of control, and they influence our family members. 
And that goes back to the video that I was sharing. Uh, somebody influenced this uh, young man. And as being a, a kid, and kids can do what they're told until they're old enough to know better. And somebody influenced him to think that it was okay to burglarize somebody's house. And furthermore, somebody influenced him to think that material items meant something when they, when they actually don't. I'm sorry, what was that? Okay, I'll keep pressing forward, and you guys feel free to join in the discussion. We can influence our neighbors, you know, by the way we got to And all of you guys are positive people. Yeah, um, you know, that I've worked with and lived around uh, and you guys definitely are the uh, influence in the neighbors and the neighborhood. And we influence and all of this is what makes up the scope of influence. And how we control ourselves, how we conduct ourselves. That's basically our ability to exercise uh and, and to actually have an effect. You know, it's our grasp of range of power. And that's what it is in a nutshell. And I think that's very important. It's very important to point out because a lot, lots of us think that we don't have any control over things. So we can't change the way the world is. We can't even change our community. But notice the community, our neighbors, our neighborhood is, is more closely within the realm of our control being that we have dotted lines around that sphere of control. You know, that means you can bleed over into that a little more easily than you can bleed over into the universe of concern. So I'm just going to open it up for discussion and see if there are any other thoughts about um, what's, what's presented here. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hey, hey, because I just want to say, um, I, I, I agree with you on that, but I think a lot of times we have a, um, a, 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 I don't necessarily fear, but uh, we take it back by our neighbors. Sometimes we, we feel like we can't get along with our neighbors or we're just too busy to uh, actually go out there and communicate with, with neighbors as well as family and friends in a way. So it kind of makes it hard for us to, to, to put that uh you get out there in the neighborhood because sometimes in the neighborhood, you, you, you mean you, you, you're too busy with work, too busy with other things and family stuff when it comes to bringing the community back together. Yeah, I, I like that, uh, Brother Scott, um, that you, you brought it up. And um, here's, you know, I've all, I never try to speak for um, everyone or as an authority on a topic. Um, but my approach to that dilemma right there is to always um, carry myself and try to make sure that my household in general is a pillar in the community, so to speak, and hopes that, you know, and also in knowing that there's always somebody looking. You know, you never know who's looking. And even if uh, you don't confront someone head on or, or um, talk to them directly, uh, you'll notice that people's behavior and their mannerism will straighten up when when a when a good man, a good woman comes around. You know, they'll know, okay, I might not want to talk about uh, or, or this kind of way around this person. You know, so that that influence extends uh, in indirect ways. And then yeah, then there's the opportunities to uh to absolutely affect like you said, um, you know, and it's always those confrontational individuals who, you know, just you know, you don't want to uh, go at them head on, but I think um, a continuous, um, dedicated, consistent, um, mean, uh, consistent behavior of, of just carrying yourself in the best way possible, um, it always has a positive effect. And that sphere of control, it, it also um, applies to your neighbors, you know, and and not saying nothing directly to their children, but realizing that their children their family members are within their sphere of influence and saying, hey, um, uh, neighbor so-and-so, uh, I noticed your kid doing X, Y, and Z. I didn't want to say nothing to him directly, um, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention. And that could go one or two ways. 
they could, I know me, I know if uh, Sister Scott or uh, Brother Scott told me my kid was acting up, I would ask him, did you bust my ass? Because I, I would have expected you to. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it could go one or two ways. They could say that or they could say, that's how I'll take care of it. And then you're extending it. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good, good point. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it, it's kind of touch and though when you're talking to kids these days that don't belong to you, unless you're in that tight, that tight group. But you, you're right. Could have been one two ways. Get them or I'll get them later. So totally agree with that. And uh, if you're not kids acting out, you better get them. That's all I did. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely glad you brought that point up because a, a lot of us are reluctant to say stuff to other people's kids. And um, Tawana brought it up in a, about two sessions back. Um, and, and this is why, and I see you guys, um, you know, that's why I don't want to push to the choir. I'm just saying it out loud because we're recording. But I see you guys at the track meets, at the sporting events. And that presence can't be, um, you can't put a price on that because those kids, they get used to seeing you there. And then it becomes more easy, easy to say, hey, what are you doing? You know, especially if you are the coach, you are that volunteer mom who's giving them a ride. Um, it, it just becomes more of a natural um, uh, means of delivering uh, uh, discipline, so to speak, um, by just being there and being present. So, um, yeah, that's a great point you brought up. A any other thoughts on it or anybody else? Yes. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Uh, kind of reminds me of that movie, Coach Carter. If um, nobody says anything at all, then it just continues. Because I know even as a young man, I had a somewhat of a rebellious attitude. And it took a stronger personality to kind of guide me in the right direction, so to speak. I ran into that uh, same situation myself where there were some young ladies that stayed in my same neighborhood. And they were walking in the middle of the street. You know, and I know they seen the car come up, but they're just walking in the middle of the street, and they kind of looked at me when I say, could you, you know, move to the side? And I had to tell them something a little bit different, but those were, were not my kids. However, I know it, it wasn't that they did not want to move because, oh, well, I don't know, you know, what I should, they did it on purpose. And so, you know, I said something to him right then, but then I thought about it. I just told him kind of move out the way, but then I went back and found him because I know where they were going because they had their, their swim towels, so I, I know the neighborhood pretty good. And I came back and I told him, he said, you know what? I said, there's other people that's in this world that, you know, there's some, some, some evil people out there that could just run you over because of your attitude. I said, you don't want to let your attitude get you hurt out in these streets, you know. Um, I know you. I know where you where you stay at. I know where your parents live, and if you if you continue to do this, and I'm I might have to go over there and say something to them. I really don't want to say something to somebody else's kids because sometimes they could go back and tell their parents in in a whole different light. You know, maybe their parents let them get away with it, and it just it you know how people want to take up for their kids, but sometimes you just have to say something because they might not they might not be getting that from home. Yeah, you write about that, and um, you definitely have to say something. And, you know, being that this is um, a mentorship forum, I like to try to throw out little tools um, that I picked up along the way, you know, being a, a certified athletics coach and also having been through, you know, recruiting school and all of these other things. Um, one of the most powerful tools I picked up along the way is reciprocity. And um, what that basically means is never ask anyone, especially someone you don't know, to do something for you and you haven't done anything for them. Um, and case in point, I like the way you approach that situation with those young ladies, um, being that you pointed out the safety aspect of it. You know, I'm trying to keep you safe. I'm trying to keep you from getting hurt. I'm trying to look out for you because everybody's not as nice as me. They might run you over, you know. And I think that goes over really well with, with young people, especially nowadays, um, because, you know, they don't get taught a lot of those basic principles that we were taught growing up about respect your elders, any elders, for that fact of the matter. You know, they're being taught a little bit different. So reciprocity is a great tool to throw into your toolkit. You know, even if it's as basic as how you young ladies doing, you look very nice today, um, you know, just little things, you know, uh, to, to let them know that you're not the enemy, you're not a bad guy, you know, 
and just opening up because a lot of us just jump down people's throats without offering any substance before giving that uh, on-the-spot correction, for lack of a better term. Any thoughts on that? No real thoughts on that exactly. I, I guess I'm uh, I'm trying to formulate this and, and make it make sense. Uh, it's really getting to the root of the problem, in in my opinion, uh, of ne not necessarily, you know, what am I doing with that sphere of influence? Why is it important? And just taking myself back to when I was a young man, what made me rebellious or what made me, you know, need that intervention from an adult uh to guide me kind of like on a better path, you know, and for, you know, for a lot of, of, of young people nowadays, it's, it's kind of the way of the world. You know, you have, you know, you, you're lucky if you have two parents in the house, uh, you, you know, they're working hard they're, to, to take care of you. So your, your biggest influence is where you spend the most time at, you know, uh, for most of them, at least, uh, 70% of their time is spent at school. What influences are they getting there? You know, um, there needs to be that, that intervention because they're kind of looking for, I won't say necessarily love, but, you know, it's kind of like looking for attention. Yeah, know? absolutely. And, and they're also looking for someone that they respect. And um, yeah. that, that takes us back to that sphere of control, our character, our thoughts, our speech, our actions, our habits. You know, how do you think those young ladies would feel um, if, the guy walking up to them, telling them to get out of the street, is the same guy they see on the side of the uh, liquor store drunk every day. Right. You they know, wouldn't so, respect it the same way. Absolutely. And then it's different if that guy who's telling them to get out of the street is the guy who just volunteered his time to come teach them whatever it is, you know, how to play a sport or how to do a resume. You know, it's, it's right. a completely different response, you know. Any thoughts? I see Denise on mute. <laughs> um, to me, they're looking for attention, and all attention isn't good attention. And in that scenario, it could have went many ways, as you guys have discussed already. But um, it's just sad. It's really sad. But you and. And girls, girls walking down the street, you know, I got a daughter. She's a teenager. I would ask her, what in the world is she doing? You know, what are you doing walking down the street like that? And I'm glad you point that out. That's why it's so important for us to have uh, that, that woman aspect of, of uh, how things are perceived uh, in this forum. And that brings uh, uh, up a whole nother can of worms. You know, what is she doing? Why is she seeking attention? you know, by walking down the middle of the street like that. So that's a, a great perspective that you brought to this. Okay, I'm not going to belabor the point um, unless there's any questions about this one chart um, on a sphere of influence. And um, But I do want the, the takeaway to be that it's very important because there's a lot of kids out there... There are a lot of kids out there who, who think the wrong thing. And if we don't control ourselves, we definitely can't um, influence them in the right ways. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and press forward. A quote every time we do these things, um, and this quote is by uh, Maha. Gandhi, and most of you know everybody, a lot of people know that Gandhi is one of the uh, biggest influences of Dr. Martin Luther King, and his quote uh, for the day is, be the change you wish to see in the world, you know, because if we're around here um, teaching our kids to steal from one another, steal from our neighbors, um, then um, we're definitely not going to get them to do any better, uh, you know, and, but if we're carrying ourselves in proud, respectable ways, our kids are going to um, carry themselves in the same way. way. And I think that that's uh, for the quarter um, who's in attendance today. And I know she has some words. It's uh, Denise Scott who just completed her um, 
her national credential for um, massage therapy. And education is the key. Um, you know, anybody who's read the autobiography of Malcolm X, and I know there's a lot of people out there who think, um, you know, that the education system has its flaws, and it does. But you can't know that there are mistakes in the book if you don't read them. And if you're going to read them, you might as well get some credit for it. So I just want to uh, take my hat off to Ms. Scott and the example that she set, not only for her daughter, but other young ladies who look up to her. And this is a great example of taking ownership of self and that lending itself to increasing your ability to influence uh, those within your, your range of, of influence. Uh, and Denise, you have any uh, thoughts to share? I don't currently have any thoughts, but to touch back on that slide that you had, how, I guess my question would be is, we live in an area of the world where the United States where racism is so prevalent. How do you allow the cultural differences to help you to influence the young people that you do have? African Americans in our area are the minority. Pacific Islanders and Native Americans are the populars, and the whites are in the majority. How do I get my children to realize that they just have to rise above all of the drama and negativity or the stereotypes in this area to be that influence? That is my struggle currently. That that is a great question. Before I give my thoughts, um, anybody else have any thoughts on that? It's the relationships you have with the individual. It's just my opinion, but it's the relationships that you have with uh, your child or the, the child where you're trying that you're trying to influence the type of relationships that they that you have with them. It's the type of language you got to speak it and put it in a way that they understand it, that they would accept. Because for everybody, that might be the answer might be different depending on who you're dealing with, uh, whoever they would look up to, or whatever situation would make sense to them. Like for my children, I tell them, I'm not telling you this for as in a fear factor, or because you know, yes, I do want you to make different choices to me, better choices to me but I want you to make them because they make sense because there, there will be good results on making good decisions based on your thoughts and how you, how you, how you process it. It's, you know, what's good for one is good for all. It's not necessarily a black or white thing. It's, it's, it's a black or white thing on paper where it's either kind of, you know, wrong or right. And, and if you do it. Yeah. You still there, Johnny? I'm yeah, still here. You, okay, I think you went out. Um, yeah, before we go any further, but that that was Johnny Roberts. I think it's his first time joining the group. Um, you want to introduce yourself real quick first, bro? Uh, how, how are you doing? Uh, my name is Johnny Roberts. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, prior service, uh, Army and Marine guy. Um, Met Gus not too long ago, and it's been a joy, and I learn a lot every time I talk to this brother, and I hope I get a chance to learn from you all. Yeah, same, same thing here, um, and I, I like your, your thoughts on that. Um, and my thoughts on it, um, Denise, is, uh, is, is this. Um, that's a very tough situation, and uh, we all go through it, not, not just our children, for the simple fact um, that uh, prejudice does exist, and me, I'm a words guy. I love words, and prejudice, you know, come from the root word judge, prejudging. People judge you before you even show up. Your reputation shows up before you arrive. I'll lock it up on a conference call. Yep. Now, the, the question might come up, okay, how can someone judge me and they don't know me? Well, what they do is they judge you based on uh, what they heard or what they saw on TV or what someone told them about black people. You know, so the they judge a lot of people. And this is a, a huge problem. But my thing is to ignore it and to tackle it head on. And when I say ignore it, I like to bring up um, the, the woman, the doctor. I forget her name, forgive me. She was on a Delta Airlines flight, and, uh, and there was a person in distress, and she was one seat over, and she tried to uh, offer her assistance to the Delta Airlines uh, 
crew person and said, hey, I'm a doctor. I can help this person. And then the woman began to give her the third degree after that. Oh, no, ma'am, we're looking for a real doctor. Now, mind you, this woman is a real doctor, but she's black, and, you know, we all look young because we got all that melanin in our skin. And so the lady began to question this lady. Meanwhile, this person is sick. And then, long story short, a white doctor ended up uh, being allowed to help this person, and she wasn't allowed, and she went to social media. And I think we shared that on our page and, uh, and talked about her situation. And my thing is why I say ignore the, the ignorance out there is because at the end of the day, her job was done when she offered her assistance. They didn't have to take her assistance. But her job was done after she offered it. And at the end of the day, whether those people want to be prejudiced or not, when she goes home, she's still making her six figures and she's still a doctor. You know, and we have to remind our kids that you're still who you are regardless of what people think you are. And you show up every day and, and you be who you are and you might change at least one person's opinion of black people by carrying yourself in a proud, respectful way, and that's maintaining that sphere of control. Any other thoughts on that? It's, hey, guys, it's Dante. What's up, Dante? Hey, how's it going? Um, like you said, it's, it's prejudging, it's the influence, it's the media, it's everything, you know, we're, old, we're constantly portrayed in a negative manner, and we have to go about changing that. You know, I can't count the number of positive stories I've heard about us in the news in any given time, but you can, you know, you, we run out of fingers and toes to count us being portrayed negatively. So it's like that's probably our biggest obstacle. That's probably one of our greatest hurdles in front of us is that just that stigma is already baked into our culture and our society. We're, we're perpetually portrayed in a negative manner. And it's like, you know, we, we all try to reach out and do the right thing, set the standard, set the example, be positive for our children, and point them in the right direction. But we've got this massive negative force in front of us. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. Um, and I don't know if it's going anywhere. That's why it's listed here, racism, under our mm-hmm. sphere of our universe of concern. We should be concerned about it. But we don't necessarily have any control over that, and this is my mm-hmm. opinion, um, immediately. You can control it in the long run, you know, if you're able to uh, extend your scope of influence, and, and that scope of influence bleeds over into that universal concern. That's why that dash is there, because you're not locked off from it, you know, being mm-hmm. able to affect the economy, being able to affect racism being able to affect other people. You're not locked off of it, but it's a little further out. And I think we shouldn't wrap ourselves around the axle of worrying about ignorance. You know, Mm -hmm. at a certain point, we have to learn to ignore ignorance. You know, and we address it head on when it's immediately in front of us, meaning it's coming from a friend. It's coming from directly within our neighborhood. And when I say neighborhood, I mean in our workplace too. You can address Mm -hmm. that head on. And you can address it effectively if you maintain a strong sphere of control if your character is of the highest moral dignity, if your thoughts are always intact, if your speech is always a certain way, and if your actions and habits, you know, portray you in a way that, that, that is respectable. You're able to address those things. But racism at large is something that we shouldn't allow to stop us from being who we uh, can be and being who we are. No, de- definitely not. Def- def- definitely not. That should that should never that that footnote that should be a footnote in the bottom of our minds, and we should constantly be moving forward, like constantly trying to improve and better ourselves. And it's that that sphere of influence. And it's like we said a couple of sessions ago. Um, where are our leaders? You know, where are our leaders at? We individually are leaders in our households. We're leaders in our community. We're leaders amongst our friends. And it's you know our sphere of influence goes there and it's light like bulb. <laughs> i had to say yeah. light bulb on that because that's what we're talking about <laughs> yeah and you know we you know i have a direct effect to my children to my co- you know to my peers to my close friends and stuff you know i always look at a situation from a different you know a different point of view like you know i used to say i'm a negative ned because I, I automatically instinctively look for the worst possible outcome in the situation that's not what i want to happen i want the best possible but i'm preparing myself psychologically for the worst and to move forward. And it's almost like our culture today, like, perpetu- in a sense, perpetuates that. But instead of 
you know, expecting the worst and hoping for the best is expecting the worst and accepting it. Absolutely. A- a- expecting it and accepting it, um, you know, and that, that is a very powerful thought, and I'm glad you, you pointed out the main takeaway, the main light bulb of, of this session, which is self-control. Because when, 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 I, when we control ourselves, we affect our children, and we affect our workplaces, we affect our neighborhoods. We influence those things by, by, through self-control. You know, and that, that is very, very, very powerful thought that you just put on it. And just like I said with that doctor, after she got off that plane, yes, she got disrespected. She was discriminated against. But they can't take nothing away from her. She's still a doctor. Mm -hmm. She's still making six figures. She can still look up on the wall and see her credentials. You know, and that that is what I mean by not allowing those things to to tear you apart because those – um. There are people out there who prejudge, and that's all they know how to do. You know, everybody's not smart. I think. Hey, um, go ahead. I think. I think. I saw. I saw a meme earlier today about Thomas Edison, and it was like when he was young, they thought he was retarded. I mean, they thought he was mentally challenged, and they sent him home because they was like they couldn't teach him. And you know, he grew up to invent things that we use in our everyday life. And his mother read that letter to him, and it said something to the effect that, you know, your child is a genius, and we can't teach him here. And when he got older and his mother passed, he found that letter and read it, and it said that he was mentally incapable of learning, so his mother taught him at home, you know. And that was uh, yeah. the spirit of influence she put on him was like, you know, hey, society says you're different, you know, but I'm not going to tell you you're different. I'm going to treat you like everybody else, and I'm going to inspire you to do great things. And this man went on to do great things, you know. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you to... brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up, Dante, because um, I was just having a, a conversation earlier in the week. Um, it had nothing to do with this, but it was about the topic of quality, okay? How do we assess quality in people and products and things? And I think the best way I was able to answer that question uh, was through an analogy. Um, okay, so you have a fishing rod in your left hand and you have a shotgun in your right hand. These are both hunting tools. Which one is the most quality tool? What are you hunting? It depends on what you hunting. I mean, exactly. It depends on what you hunt. You can catch some fish. You can catch some fish with a shotgun, but you ain't going to be able to eat it. You can catch mm-hmm. a bear with a fishing rod, but he going to do something to you. You see what I'm saying? It depends right. on what you're hunting. And that's like why that. we, we, we have to point out to our children why God made them. We have to point it out to them. Because just because you're not good at some of the stuff these people throw at you in these schoolhouses, that don't mean you're not a quality individual. You have a purpose. Mm-hmm. And it's up yep. to us to influence that purpose. Definitely. Yep. Uh, uh, any other thoughts before we press forward? I'm not rushing this thing because I think the conversation is awesome today, discussion. And I didn't prepare a lot of slides because I wanted to be um, – Uh, a discussion. The content from today's uh, session came from the highest effects of people by Stephen R. Cub. Um, it is one uh, you know to to have the kids read, especially teenagers. Um, you know, it just gives them tools um, to keep them focused because there's so much chaos nowadays. You know, and we got to be able to thrive in chaos. You know, all the hate hatred going on. You know, the stuff that the media perpetuates. And, and those those guys are trying to make money at the end of the day. And they get a rise out of people um, through fear and through hatred. So we got to keep our kids and keep ourselves uh, focused. You know, so th- this is a good um, book um, that, uh, that that hones in on certain skills that uh, an individual can apply and put in his or her repertoire to keep himself focused. And that's all the... Um, formal content that I have for today, and I'm not going to stop recording because in the past, our best discussion came after the fact, but um, it's just good to be in the non- 
Well, I missed I missed the first half. I had a family function. When we talk about, you know, today's talk is the sphere of influence, and we went back. We go back a couple of sessions. You know, we talked about, you know, setting a standard, oh, setting you a moral, here, setting, and I setting a moral back. code. Yeah, absolutely. And we need to revisit that. And um, mm. and just like you said, Dante, where are our leaders? Well, I think we got six of them here right now. We you do. Know? We really, and, we really do. That's, I've been I've been struggling with that well, since we had that discussion. I've been struggling with that because I look at it as like, you know, like we said, well, we don't have strong leaders today because of fear of reprisal. And it's the truth. You know, nobody, the, the weapons brought against us, when we step out there, they will find every piece of dirt, everything to paint us in a negative light, no matter how positive we try to be. And history has proven that. So if you look at our two greatest leaders in our lifetime in the last hundred years, you look at Dr. King and Malcolm X, they took two, they both led from the front. They took two different approaches, and they ended up in the same predicament, you know. And it's like, you look at, you look at, you look at our heroes. You look at Bill Cosby. For years, he showed us in a positive manner, and then all of a sudden, they came against him and used every tool available to them to destroy him. Yep. And it's that, wow. it's that you know, nobody wants to build, but nobody wants to jump, nobody, none of us. I... I'm not sure if I want to put my head out there to be put on, on the chopping block, but somebody has to do it. Yeah. Somebody, and, um, somebody, somebody has to step up and do it. Yeah. You know, and, and go ahead. I don't want to be the only one talking. Somebody got something to say. Uh, you know, just thinking about it from a minority point of view to moving forward, we, you know, it's, it's good to understand how things got there to begin with. Uh, there was a short read that I had read once. It was a, uh, Breaking the Curse of Willie Lynch. You know, mm-hmm. and it talks about how, you know, I'm erased to history. I'm going, you know, the, the different things that they did to perpetuate, you know, kind of where we are now. And it's to pit one against the other, you know, and all of these tools and tactics to keep this. He said, I'm going to create a system that lasts a thousand years. And though, yeah, legally we're free in that sense of the word, but the same spheres of influence that that program uh, created are still active now, you know, unified and being together, you know, it's harder to fight an enemy like that. But if you're already fighting against an enemy, not giving it a color, but let's give it a, uh, a name like racism, you know, then if you're already fighting an enemy, we can't fight ourselves and the enemy. Absolutely. We- you know, yep. there has to be some sort of, of unity in there, and we have to do a good job of not only – it shouldn't always be a negative conversation like this positive one we're having now where we try to put our heads together and figure out moving forward what we can, what we can do to better things. But there's also the flip side of the coin and say, well, okay, well, what can we do about the negative, negativity within our community? You know, uh, if I see that brother going the wrong direction, am I, am I willing to, to help him? You know, Absolutely. or am I going to talk about him like, you know, well, he's a thief, he's a robber, he's this, he's that, but what am I going to do to help him? You know, yeah, we are I think, to I, I think uh, Brother Scott and also uh, Dante um, brought up a good point uh, about influencing our brother because uh, what Dante said was we each have a sphere of control, which means we each have a sphere of influence. So yeah. it's a matter of like Brother Scott brought up, either going head on with that individual who's doing wrong or finding someone that he or she respects and yeah. telling them about it and telling them about it. it. It's the way you have to do it. You know? So I think those two gentlemen brought up a great point with that. And that's how we make our neighborhoods better because we can't control everybody else. We can control ourselves and we can mm-hmm. communicate with the individuals who have the influence to control the others, you know, so it's about communicating. It's about reenacting the village, you know, generate it, wake it up and tell that village, Hey, we need to work together. Mm -hmm. That That is a great point. That is a good point. Cause I know I had a family member that I had to do that with, you know, um, there was something that I needed to tell him, but I couldn't, put it into words that I know that he'll respect because I didn't live the same type of life he did. But I know, you know, I had another relative that did and that would 
put those words in ways he could understand, he would respect, and he would actually receive it. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we figured out a long time ago when this thing first started um, that uh, there are different uh, tiers to mentorship. You know, you got Denise, who's, uh, you know, a graduate, and a lot of us, others who are graduates, and then there's other guys who probably not here yet who, you know, may have done some time in prison but are living a uh, positive life now. You know, yeah, that yeah. individual might not be ready to talk to you, you know, college graduate. He might not be on your level yet. You know, sometimes you need to be able to recognize when I need to get a middleman to talk to this individual who's on that right. level and who can get through, through to him a little, uh, a, a little more effectively than I can. Right. And then later on down the line, um, you know, that individual might get, get their self in order and say, okay, I'm ready to um, extend my education. Now they're ready to talk to that college graduate. How did you do it? How did I get there? You know what I'm saying? It, it, it's, that, it's that type of a, a, a village network that we need to reinvigorate. Definitely, def- definitely, definitely. I had, a, I had a coworker tell me years ago when I was a production planner, he says, I should never look down on another man unless I'm helping him up. Absolutely. And, and that, has always, that has always resonated with me, that I should never, you know, we talked about, um, ju- you know, prejudging some prejudice, you know, prejudging someone. Like, it's, it's, it's in our everyday life, but we need to aspire, rise above that. And that's, you know, that's one of those principles we need to reinstill. We should be never looking down on another one of our brothers. We should never look down on another man. Let's yeah. open them up. No, we shouldn't, man. And and I love Maya Angelou's quote. Um, I did the best I could until I knew better, and then I did better. You know, and that's yeah. what most people are doing. Because when I saw that young man, um, Trayvon uh, Johnson clothes. It's not a necessity. It's a want. You know, I just thought that was really tragedy. Uh, that was a real tra- tragedy. And I can never pick myself, uh, uh, force myself to look down on this individual. I can't even force myself to look down on these young ladies that were in his life because obviously they had a part and in influence in his thought processes by saying how else is he supposed to get money? You know, well, you know, this is one of these one of these uh, instances where they're doing what they know how to do. And it's on us to make ourselves more accessible because we know other ways. And this is a good form to do it. There are many others. You know, we record these sessions. And I'm just praying and hoping that, you know, more people like this that we just don't know about will, will discover this content and realize that there are tons of more ways. Reach out to us, you know, so that we can help point you to those ways. You know, because just like I can create a website, you can too. You know, just like I can set up an e-commerce on our website and sell t-shirts, you can too. You know, if you want to earn some money to get you something nice to wear to college. But you don't have to be going into somebody's house, putting your life Mm -hmm. on the line, and also endangering that person's life. Because if they confront you while you're in their house, it's going to be kill or be killed. Mm -hmm. I always think, I think the biggest thing I struggle with is you know, you want to do so much more than you're able to do. You know, even though we're able to do a lot within our sphere of influence, you know, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to put in words. It's like if if I know that there's a large criminal element because there's a lack of jobs, or if I know that, you know, some people come out of prison and they really want to do better with their life, but it's just, you know, they put in a situation where they it's, they they do background checks and it's hard for them to get that job that when they come home, they still feel like a, you know, a respectable man or a woman, you know, yeah. and what could I do to, to do better for everybody? You know, not just myself, but what, what could I do? You know what I mean? Absolutely. And, and um, I always want success so I could share it. Yeah. And those types of individuals, I hope they'll reach out to us as well, you know, because if anything, you know, we, we can give some advice, you know, and it won't be an overnight success, but there are ways um, to, like I said, to, to earn a dollar to, you know, 
by being online and doing some freelance work. And just like me and Amir were talking about uh, through agriculture, if you can get somebody to allow you to farm their land, you can make um, a decent earning by, by selling produce. You know, that, that yeah. sort of deal. You know, and nobody's going to do a background check on you to see if you, you're capable of tilling the earth and planting some seeds. You right. know, that, that sort of thing right there. You know, and a lot of us, you know, come from the same brotherhood, you know, and sisterhood on the site. And, and I think it comes down to gauging ourselves, you know. And if you can't do it all, do a little bit. You know, do what yeah, you can. as long as you're doing something. Yeah, a- absolutely. Just do a little bit. Do what you can. And, you know, if God aligns your path with somebody who needs some help, render that assistance. Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh I'm on a um if if anybody has any more conversation, feel free to bring it up. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh for the sake of Are you cutting in and out? of not making the session, the recorded session parts.